It's better to watch TV than to sit alone in your crib, for example, and isolated. And people have enough food now, so the really low end of the intelligence spectrum has been truncated and the general population IQ has increased. So with regards to institutions like the University of Toronto, say, the average IQ at the University of Toronto is somewhere between 120 and 130. And we know that because we've tested it. And it's not surprising because you're basically selected for cognitive prowess, right? Because grades are a rough marker of intelligence. Conscientiousness, by the way, also matters. Independent trait. Because the best two predictors of university grades are conscientiousness and intelligence. Not creativity, by the way. Zero correlation with creativity. So the question is then what do you do? Well, what you should do is what I suggested today, I would say, is take responsibility for your lives and understand that what you have came at a terrible cost and that you have an ethical obligation to use it properly and that would be sufficient to pay for the sins of your ancestors, so to speak. I think it's absolutely reprehensible that the radical left dares to attribute to, to ethnically identified groups collective guilt. There's absolutely no excuse for that. It's completely murderous and that should be rejected out of hand. So, but that's independent of the issue about what you should do given that Part of your wealth is a consequence of historical catastrophe, so you should try to sort that out, roughly speaking, and for everyone's benefit, but not necessarily because you're any more guilty personally. You're guilty as hell personally, but so is everyone else. That's the critical thing. So is everyone else. Okay, I would, I would like to answer that question, but I can't. And the reason, there's two reasons for that. The one is that it's there's, there's a large element of the answer that has to be legal, and I can't do that. And the other part of it is because I'm actually too tired to formulate a coherent response to that. So, and I don't want to formulate an incoherent response, so I'm sorry that I can't be... I mean, obviously I believe that people's right to communicate should be as untrammeled as possible, but to bridge the gap between that and your specific concern requires a feat of mental energy that I can't do at the moment, and maybe, maybe ever. You know, we have all sorts of privileges, and most people have privileges of all sorts, and you should be grateful for your privileges and work to deserve them, I would say. But the, the idea that you can target an ethnic group with a collective crime regardless of the specific innocence or guilt of the constituent elements of that group, there is absolutely nothing that's more racist than that. that if, you, if you really want to know more about that sort of thing, you should read about the kulaks in the, in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, K-U-L-A-K-S, because they were, they were farmers who were very productive. They were the most productive element of the agricultural strata in, in Russia. And they were virtually all killed or raped and robbed by the collectivists who insisted that because they showed signs of wealth they were criminals and, 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 and robbers. So, and the, one of the consequences of the prosecution of the Kulaks was the death of six million Ukrainians from a famine in the 1930s. The idea of collectively held guilt at the level of the individual as a legal or philosophical principle is dangerous it's precisely the sort of danger that people who are really looking for trouble would push. So, and, and just a cursory glance at 20th century history should teach anyone who wants to know exactly how, how unacceptable that is. With regards to your first, okay, there's the safe space issue, but you also said something right at the beginning. You, you, you announced your sexual preference at the beginning, and I understand exactly why you did that, but I, I have a comment about that. And this is something for people in the audience to think about. I've received at least 25 letters from um, transsexual people. And that's quite a few because there aren't that many transsexual people, right? So, so they're rare. They're, they're very rare. And every single one of them but one was supportive. And the one that wasn't supportive was mildly critical. And they said exactly the same thing that, that you said, rough, roughly speaking. Is that, and so what we, one of the things we want to remember is that just because some, some noisy activists stand up and say, because I'm a member of this group, or even worse, because I say I'm a member of this group, I am therefore an advocate for that group's interests, is we should just dispense with that, um, with that self-identification as a worthy representative instantaneously because it's predicated on the idea that one dimension of a person's identity is sufficiently uh, what would you say broad and all-encompassing so that you can infer their political stance 
for example, which you can't. And so the, the trans people that have written me, they all say the same thing. A, those people do not speak for me. B, we're not all the same. C, most of us think that the enforced pronoun issue is doing nothing but drawing negative attention to us. D, most of us just want to be referred to by the other pronoun. That's the whole point. This has been very, very uh, reassuring to me because one of the things I presumed right from the onset was that there was no evidence whatsoever that this nonsensical leg legislation and the postmodern idiocy behind it is in fact demanded by this community or that it will in any way be in anyone's best interest. No, I don't buy it. And I think it's rotten right to the core. So, and then the safe, safe space issue. It's like if you need a safe space, see a therapist. <laughs> really, really, university, university is not a safe space. If university is done right, it is a radically unsafe space. If you want to go somewhere and get yourself taken apart intellectually, and then hopefully put back together, then you go to university. Everything you believe should be challenged in every possible way, but not in a destructive sense, right? Like when you're renovating a house, you don't just burn it to the ground and walk away. <laughs> That's what the postmodernists do to adolescents, by the way. You dismantle it in consultation with its occupant, attempting to build something more beautiful and functional on the, on the foundation. It's not a safe space, you know, in, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning. I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right, there isn't anything more unsafe than that. And all of them, virtually all of them, write back to me afterwards and say, uh, th this was the most worthwhile class I've ever had in my life, and it changed my life. It's like, well, I'm teaching you the worst possible thing about yourself. And your response is, Oh, that was so useful, and I'm way better than I was. You know, it's, it's, but it's in keeping with the idea that you need to be exposed to things that you fear and hate, because that's where salvation lies, roughly speaking. So, what, is there anything to ground our confidence in the logos? Yeah, sure, two things. One, the testimony of the ages. Two, practical experience. Try it. Try it. You know, and what you, you start by, while well, doing what I suggested earlier, which is fixing the things around you that, that you can fix. Because that's like the embodied manifestation of the Logos. That's, by the way, why Christ was a carpenter, archetypally speaking, right? Because he fixed things. So, and you know, if you're a bad carpenter, the things you fix fall apart. So there's truth in being a carpenter. But then the next thing is, you, you probably can't speak the truth because no one can. But you cannot say things you know to be lies. And that's a really good place to start. And oh, you, you know, you can learn to pay attention to that very rapidly. You kind of know already. But you, it's a consultation with your embodied being. When you say something you know to be false, you won't be able to stand up straight. You'll get weak. You'll feel a physical di di division take place inside you. It's partly shame, because what you're not, you're failing to bear the burden of your existence, and you're revealing that to yourself by your use of deceit. Stop saying things you know to be false, and then watch what happens. And this is the existential element of it. It can't be proved, as far as I can tell, the same way that you would prove a scientific hypothesis. It can only be proved in the confines of your life. And you actually have to sacrifice your life to the Logos in order to find out. Because the only way you'll test it is by acting it out and see what happens. You don't get to do it twice. So, but I think the consequences will reveal themselves relatively quickly. My experience has been that, because I'm always working with, with my clients, I, and I see clinical clients 20 hours a week, roughly speaking, and we're always working on stating things more clearly, trying to make things better, you know, and, and it almost inevitably at least makes the horrible things bearable, which is a lot better, you know, and, and sometimes makes mediocre things way better as people's lives expand and they get more confident and 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 straighten things out around them so so it's the testimony of the ages and your willingness to test it existentially in in the confines of your own life you'll find that there isn't anything more interesting than you can do because what ha it takes the predict it takes the stultifying predictability out of your life you never know what will happen if you say something that's true it's a miracle miracles will happen and that's a very interesting. It's crazily interesting.
And so that's good, crazily interesting. You've got that to set, to set, you've got that to set against tragedy. And so, well, so you, you can try it.